quarters of the people are Muslims, and then you want to make an Armenia, this is a problem. What do you do? And the only thing you can do is you can have a big war, a war in which the Muslims, the Turks and the Kurds, are either killed or forced out. It's the only thing that could possibly work. But they couldn't do it themselves. They, they didn't have the people, they didn't have, so they had to do it as Armenian scholars like Luis Del Bandian has written. They had to plan to have a war. They had to have war time because that would drive the Turks out the way they had been driven out of Europe. And this was the intention. They were going to start a revolt, actually a number of revolts. The Turks and Kurds would respond by slaughtering Armenians, and then the Europeans would step in on the side of the Armenians. Uh, the problem that they had was that uh, the British and French were so afraid of the Russians, and the Russians, you know, that they never came together. It never came together. They didn't attack, they didn't actually create an Armenia until they started just before the First World War. The Armenian plan actually was beginning to succeed, but it was too late. All right, now I mean, that's sort of a long explanation for your question, but I hope it did answer it somewhat. Okay. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I thought you were asking why the Armenians did it. Well, very quickly, I'll say that the, uh, the American missionaries were deeply prejudiced people who had a firm belief that Christians were the only good people. I mean, I, that's an exaggeration, and it, does, you know, it obviously is a, a statement of a generality. Some were much worse, some were much better. But basically, there was no way you could succeed as a missionary if you wrote back home saying that the Muslims were good people. This all changed. Today, the people that are missionaries, and even in the, uh, Mustafa Kemal's time, some of them were very sympathetic to Turks and very close to Turks and all that. But in the, in the 1890s and into World War I, they were people who uh, were simply supremely prejudiced. If, if you don't mind my suggesting, somewhere around here, I brought a copy of a book that I've just published that's called The Turk in America. And it, it, it hundreds of pages on why the missionaries did what they did. So if you want to, uh, <coughs> If you want to spend $35, we can arrange it. <laughs> yes. um, Professor uh, McCarthy, welcome to London. Uh, we indeed appreciate I'm here. Yeah, go ahead. We indeed appreciate your, your time for taking, um, taking your time to tell us some of the stories behind this um, saga, Armenian issue. It sounds, as, uh, it sounds to me as if um, the so-called Armenian genocide will not have happened if Turks were Christians. I think there's a lot of religious elements in this story. And also, on top of that, I would say that the, some of the missionaries having changed heart towards the end of the Ottoman Empire may have been persuaded to tell the truth eventually, but it has never happened. So it sounds like the Turks have failed somewhere in their strategy in telling the world that this was all a pack of lies. So my question to you is, what do you think is the best course of action to follow, or the best strategy to follow from now on? Because during the last 16 years, I was personally involved in defending the, the Turkish interest against the Armenian lies. We always came, came up against all sorts of obstacles, which a lot of them were artificial obstacles. So what would you recommend us to follow as a strategy? Well, I think and I'm as a closing speech, I want to send greetings. I brought you greetings from Dr. Atayerim and Dr. Kaya Bukataman in, 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 uh, in America, who asked me to convey their best wishes for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please send mine to them as well. Uh, look, there is primarily a political problem. Uh, the parliaments and the the Ealing City Council and all these parts of people that passed genocide resolutions, uh, they're political purposes. They, they know nothing about the history of the Ottoman Empire and they aren't willing to learn about it. So I leave any of those questions of political purposes to people who know about politics, to diplomats, to politicians. That's not my job. My job is to try to find out what really happened and to proclaim that that really happened. So my suggestion, uh, if I have the suggestion about you're asking what to do, I would suggest you try to get the information that is available about what really is Turkish history, not just Armenians, but all the good things that are in Turkish history. To get that Armenian, I mean that history of the Turks, get it out to school children, get it out to newspapers, get it out to people that right now have the same kinds of prejudices against you and your ancestors that were here in the 1890s. 
So my suggestion is an academic suggestion, because that's what I am. I'm not a politician, thank God. No, I'm not a politician. <laughs> the point is, I would try to get the information out. Just, we're going to go in order one, two, and then three here. Okay. Just. Well, uh, my name is Armen Malkasian, UCL. Uh, indeed, uh, I personally look forward to the future and look forward to reconciliation process, uh, and not the escalation between Armenia and Turkey and look forward to opening the last closed borders between Armenia and Turkey and the good neighborship that could be established between these neighbor nations. And thanks for your presentation. Thanks for the facts and statistics that you brought forward, which are quite shocking. And uh, the presentation is also very exemplary of how the freedom of speech and opinion could be expressed. Because, uh, well, I believe that this freedom and these rights are fundamental no matter how deceptive and uh, prejudiced they could be. And in this uh, uh, light, I would kindly uh, like to ask you two questions with the permission of the chair. The first question is, in general, do you think that denial of crime is first immoral and hence offensive? Uh, I missed. I denial of crime, is it immoral or and or offensive? Wait, what? Wait, but I, denial of crime is immoral or offensive? Yeah. Well, yes. go ahead. Think go ahead. Go ahead with your second question, and then we'll give it. to the yeah, uh, that can be contingent from the answer of the first question. If possible, I get with the answer of the first one, and then we'll continue with the second one. Okay. Would, uh, if, if you want to know whether denial of a crime is is morally offensive, uh, the difficulty is when there is a complete disagreement about whether a crime was committed or not. So, if you go into a court and there are two sides, the prosecution and the defense and one denies it and one says it's true, neither one is morally wrong. This is what has to take place. So what I would say is, when you're talking about reconciliation, the only thing I can say about any of those things is the way we find those things out is with historical debate, is with discussion among historians, is with Turkish and Armenian and American and British and other European historians getting together and going over a topic. And, hope, and the more that that takes place, the better off we are. Please. And, uh, Bri I, briefly, and, please. Yeah, yes. And I completely agree with you that here is the search of truth, what the truth is. And in this regard, do you think that, for example, Benedict XV, Roman Pope, or Byron, or Nobel Prize winner, or Han Pamuk. Is it, uh, is the truth, uh, whatever is said by them, that there were massacres and genocide happened in Would you Turkey, to... or is it the truth that uh, whatever is said by those who deny the genocide and massacres? Would you trust a plumber to do heart surgery? <laughs> I would, be, I would be perfectly willing to listen to what these people say if they gave me any historical evidence behind what they're saying. But the fact is, with all respect to the Pamuk family, uh, he is not an expert in these matters, and indeed I think he probably is very sorry to say what he did. But in general, I mean, the French parliament makes a decision, and I, as a historian, I am supposed to believe that that's based on any kind of reality. It's ridiculous. I'd rather stick with the plumber. Well, actually, no, okay. but still. We have, yes, over here. Then we'll go. My name is Tatevi Gregorian. I represent the Forum of Armenian Associations of Europe. Mr. McCarthy, um, you just said 
that you would like to see some evidence of the genocide, I'll tell you, you either have to be a complete ignorant or a really bad scholar not to see the evidence. You are in a complete, you are in a complete minority. This evening you have embarrassed yourself. There were rumors about you that you are funded by Turks. I have read your books. I have, um. I have read your, I have read your books where you have changed your opinion. You have changed your opinion suddenly. Okay. Can I just say one you, thing? Right. Can, can I just say one thing? Okay, civilized debate. I will give you my civilized debate. If you have a question, I will give you. I have a question. I will ask a question. Mr. McCarthy. Just Mr. McCarthy. I have a question for you. Go ahead in with your, your question. very, yes. very pathetic presentation this evening, I am asking the question. In this presentation, you presented sketches, not one photograph. Why don't you ask any of these people to go on Google this evening and put Armenian genocide and see the pictures? You're talking about no okay. evidence? Go and have a look at the photographs taken well, by the Germans, to, taken right. by the Americans. There is so much evidence I, that you have to be a complete Mr. ignorant can to I, claim there is none. Okay. Okay. If I can, if I can answer answer you now, just I have two things just, to say. Just, yeah? may I just, Do you want to say a yes. word? I want to, I want to warn the audience, just as we listen to Professor McCarthy, I think, LSE takes it very seriously that principles of freedom of speech an expression of thought is observed by all in the audience, okay? Which means that if you want to ask a question to our speaker, you are entitled to ask a question to the speaker. And I want people in the audience, A, from refrain from insulting the speaker, and also refrain from <laughs> Also refrain from attacking or abusing people who are asking questions. Okay. A long, okay. A, a long time ago, the philosopher Aristotle wrote about the rules of debate. And one of the things he stated was that there was something called polluting the well. And what this meant was that people who couldn't win an argument through logic instead decided to insult the other side. I, I believe an example of what some of the difficulty is. I believe that one of, the, one of the difficulties is from a statement such as the one that was just made about the photographs that I supposedly avoided. I believe I was speaking about Sassoon in 1894. If you believe, if you believe that there were photographs in Sassoon in 1894, then I would like to sell you some land in Florida. <laughs> well, clearly I won't be able to recognize all of you, but I'm trying to be as random as possible. And there is a lady here. Yes, I recognized her some time ago. Go ahead. Thank you. And then we'll go with you. Um, thank you. First of all, I'd like to clarify uh, what you said. Is it just about the Sassoon event, or you can say it for the whole Armenian genocide, the falsified sources and uh, not reliable sources? I have, I have like I said, the book, that's a, the book that has 300 pages and more on, on all this kind of thing. I actually have some things on falsifications of World War I, of which there are a lot. But uh, unfortunately, with time, there, there's a limit to what you could do. And the, the organizers specifically said that it would be good to speak about something other than World War I. Okay. Right? And so uh, be, because of that, I avoided World War I. But indeed, there is uh, quite a bit about, from, uh, about phony uh, Turkish statistics, for instance, uh, at the British Propaganda Bureau. There are, are any number of other things. But as I say, I recommend that you, you take a look at the book. Uh, you don't really have to buy it in a library somewhere. But you can take, take, take a look at the book and then see whether my arguments make any sense because there's, there's an awful lot on World War I. Okay? Well, yeah, we'll try to have a look. 
So if we generalize to 